Good evening and welcome to the Singapore Presidential Forum 2023. We have three candidates running to be our nation's head of state. They are Mr. Ng Kok Song, Mr. Tamin Shamungaratnam, and Mr. Tan Kin Lian. Gentlemen, welcome. Over the next hour, I will be asking each of them a series of questions and they will take turns to be the first to answer. The candidates will each get the same amount of time to respond. Once that allotted time is up, their mics will be faded off. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone about the role of the elected president. Singapore's elected president has three broad roles. Perhaps the most visible of these is a ceremonial. At home, the president presides over important national events, such as the opening of parliament and the National Day Parade. The president also represents Singapore internationally by hosting visiting dignitaries and making state visits overseas. In the community, the president serves as a symbol of national unity. Traditionally, the president actively supports social causes, sports, culture, the arts and community events. But perhaps the most important role of the president is custodial. And the president exercises this role in three areas. First, to safeguard against the government misusing the nation's past reserves. Second, to ensure the impartiality of the public service, he can veto the appointment or removal of certain key public office holders. And third, the president serves a protective function. For example, the president can authorize an investigation by the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, the CPIB, if the prime minister refuses to give such authorization. Under the Singapore constitution, the elected president must be and be seen to be politically neutral. The president cannot appoint his own preferred candidates to key appointments. He cannot decide on the investment policies of Singapore's investment entities, such as GIC. He cannot express public views on legislation or government policy without being advised to do so by the government. The exception is matters related to the president's custodial powers. He cannot pursue a different foreign policy from the government. Well, let's begin. Candidates will have two minutes to answer the first question, and we will be starting with Mr. Ng Kok Song. And the question is, what experience and expertise do you possess that make you the most qualified candidate to be the president? Mr. Ng, your time starts now. I humbly offer the people of Singapore three qualifications. First, competence and experience. The president has got this critical role of safeguarding our reserves and protecting the integrity and impartiality of certain positions in the public service. I spent 45 years in public service, and during that time I spent 30 years at the GIC and 15 years at the MAS in helping to build up our reserves and in helping to build up the GIC as a leading sovereign wealth fund in the world. So I'm competent and experienced in dealing with matters in regard to our reserves. And secondly, I offer the people of Singapore my non-partisan status. I do not belong to any political party, whether it's the People's Action Party or opposition parties. And this is important because the president has to play a unifying role for our nation. So regardless of race, language, religion and political affiliations. Thirdly, I offer the people of Singapore that I'm a person of trust and responsibility. During my entire life, I took responsibility for caring for my family when my father lost his job. I took responsibility for looking after my wife when she was dying of cancer. And I took responsibility in my job of navigating the GIC through several financial crises. So experience and competence, non-partisanship, a trustworthy and responsible person. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Mr. Tarman, you are next and your time starts now. Well, first I must say my fellow candidates each bring distinct strengths and reputations and life stories, which I respect. Uh, but I'll have to say respectfully 
that none of them brings the breadth and depth of experience uh, that I have and which I'll bring to the presidency. My experience internationally in flying the Singapore flag high across a range of fields, economics and finance, environment, pandemic preparedness, even human development and education. My breadth of experience on everything to do with the reserves, I mean, put quite simply, I know the whole system of safeguarding and using reserves inside out. No one can fool me. And in particular, I'm deeply familiar with the areas that are relevant to the presidency, which are not to do with the management of reserves, not to do with the investment of reserves, but to do with the safeguarding and use of reserves, not the investment of reserves, but the use of reserves. And that's where my experience as a Minister of Finance for nine years, Deputy Prime Minister and Senior Minister, uh, have frankly been invaluable. And my direct experience of dealing with several crises is invaluable. Thirdly, uh, I'm the candidate that has a real track record of experience on the ground, of uniting people, building community spirit, creating second chances, and giving hope to people. So it's that combination of a presence on the international stage that's respected, of a breadth of knowledge on our entire system of safeguarding and using reserves, including the Ministry of Finance role and the government's role, not just that of the GIC or the investment entities. And thirdly, a real track record on the ground my record in Jurong speaks for Your itself. time is up, uh, Mr. Tarman. Uh, just a reminder that your mics will be faded off once the allotted time is up. Mr. Tan, you're next. Your no. time starts now. Uh, the part of my working career that is most relevant to the duties of the President is my 30 years as Chief Executive Officer of NTUC Income. In this job, I was responsible, among others, for the oversight of the investment of the insurance fund, which grew 600 times over 30 years. And uh, at the time I left, it was $17 billion. This experience is relevant to the duty of the president in safeguarding the reserves. I had to appoint senior people into the top levels of my management I believe that a good management team should comprise of people with knowledge and people with practical experience. I aim to balance the team with both skills and not be skilled to one or the other. I, I wish to add another important point for the president to do his duty well and to serve the people well he has to exercise an independent mind in giving approval for the use of the past reserves and for appointment into the top levels of the public service. He should look at each recommendation with a guiding principle. Is the recommendation good for the people? An independent president needs to have a good knowledge of the subject matter and the courage to take a stand when the need arises. I have that knowledge and courage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tan. Now for the next series of questions, you will each get one and a half minutes. And this time we will start with Mr Tarman. The elected president is a safeguard against the government misusing past reserves. Beyond what the government tells you, what factors would you consider before using the second key to pass reserves? Your time well, starts now. Unfortunately, from time to time, we're going to get crises. COVID was not the last of them. We may have major crises coming up our way. And the first thing the president has to understand is the nature of the crisis. Is this for the short term? Or is this a crisis where we can't actually see the end of the crisis? We can't see the bottom to the crisis. The second key to allow for the reserves to be used is useful only where you cannot see the end of the crisis and you can't see the bottom to the crisis. But secondly, the money has to be spent wisely. 
And that means not just helping people to survive, which is, of course, very important, our firms, our SMEs and Singaporeans to survive the storm, but to build strengths in a crisis so that we emerge even stronger. That's critical to the wise use of our reserves in a crisis. But thirdly, it's got to be fair. If we're using our reserves in a crisis, if we're going to spend monies on Singaporeans and firms, it's got to be distributed fairly. So if you're saving jobs, you've got to make sure we help lower income Singaporeans, middle income Singaporeans, build up strengths for the recovery, build up new skills, new capabilities for the recovery. Don't just favour the big firms, don't just favour those who already have it good. Be fair. Thank you, Mr. Tarman. Mr. Tan, you are next and your time starts now. Uh, the two key factors, I have two factors. Uh, the first is, uh, is this use of the reserve in the interest of the people? And the second factor I will consider is, is this a proper use of the reserves? Uh, for example, is it uh, spent unwisely uh, or is it spent wisely? For example, our biggest use of past reserves uh, was during the COVID. Uh, a large sums of money was set aside uh, and uh, there was some part of the money that went into banks that were making huge profits uh, and they were given uh, a subsidy by the government. I consider, I consider that to be uh, not suitable use of the reserves. And I don't want to say that this is looking back at the benefit of hindsight. Uh, I think the president should have the uh, ability to uh, understand what is proper use and what is the uh, uh, wrong use of the reserve. So I will certainly uh, want to uh, examine uh, carefully, uh, is this good for the people and is this the proper use of the reserves? Thank you. Do you have anything else to add? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Mr. Ng, it's your turn now and your time starts now. What other factors you know, should I consider when the government makes a request to draw on our past reserves? I think the critical thing is to understand that our past reserves should benefit present generations of Singaporeans as well as future generations. So how much to save and how much to spend is a very important decision. So I would like to know from the government, what is the total size of our reserves? How much are you asking to spend out of the reserves? What are the assumptions that the government is making regarding the crisis? Is it an international crisis, a domestic crisis? How do you expect, how long do you expect the crisis to last? Another question which I would ask is, have you exhausted the possibility of raising revenues from other areas before asking me, the President, for permission to draw on the past reserves. And also, quite importantly, I think we need to understand what are the assumptions that the government is using in regard to what are the expected returns on our reserves for the future? How does that compare with our historical rates of return on the reserves? So these are issues which I have been quite familiar with while working at the GIC. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Well, we'll be starting with Mr. Tan for the next question. Each of you is linked to either the establishment, the ruling party or the opposition. How then can you convince voters you're not politicizing the election and you will exercise your powers without fear or favor? Mr. Tan, your time starts now. Uh, the most important consideration is what are the problems facing the people and uh, do we understand the problem? And uh, if we do, understand, uh, we, do, we do understand the problem, what are possible solutions? So I therefore look at uh, uh, the role of the president uh, in this way. Uh, it, it is not helpful when you are solving difficult problems to mix up the concept of is this the solution of party A or party B? I do not believe in uh, politicking uh, because it's taking away time uh, that should be go into understanding the problem and solving the problem. So I do not agree 
uh, with the framing uh, that any solution is uh, politicizing. Uh, I think we should focus on the problem uh, and uh, use all available uh, uh, resources and knowledge uh, to see what is the best way to solve the problem uh, that faces the country and the people. And we do have many problems that are unsolved over past uh, decades, such as the low birth rate uh, and uh, uh, life becoming more difficult. Uh, these are very important things to solve and we shouldn't be thinking about politicizing. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Mr. Ng, you are next and your time starts now. When you speak about politicizing the election, I stand as a person who does not belong to any political party. I do not belong to the People's Action Party. I do not belong to any opposition party. So there's no better safeguard to have a non-politicized presidential election, to have candidates who do not have any political affiliations. And the other point I would make is that if you have candidates who are supported or endorsed by any political party, there's a danger that the president cannot act without fear or favour because the president might have been influenced in serving the political agenda of the political parties concerned. So I stand as the only non-partisan candidate in this presidential election. Do you have anything else to add? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Mr. Tarman, you are next. You have one and a half minutes and it begins now. Let's uh, avoid simple labels. This is a contest between individuals who, who have to be assessed on their character, whether they have the spine, whether they have the track record, whether they'll be able to keep the trust of the people who are electing them. If we go with the label of whether you've been a member of a political party or not, I think that's uh, extremely simplistic. It would also have ruled out, by the way, President Ong Teng Chong would have ruled out past candidates like Mr. Tan Cheng Bok, President Tony Tan. It would have ruled out also a whole set of people, if you think about it, who may not be members of a political party, but who have owed their positions to their bosses who were ministers in the government of the day, all our senior civil servants, all the senior people on the public track, they owe their positions to bosses who are political figures. Are they obligated to their bosses because of that? Not necessarily. It depends on the individual. Let's say you have a private company, you have a construction company that depends on government contracts, or you have a fund management company that depends on government monies. Does that make you not independent? Not necessarily. It depends on your character, your track record. So I would say avoid the simple labels, make this a contest between individuals. Do they have the spine? Do they have the track record? Thank you, Mr. Darman. Well, we are back to Mr. Ng, starting for the next question. Well, the president has been described as Singapore's chief diplomat. What unique traits do you possess that will help you represent Singapore on the global stage? Your time starts now. During my 30 years career at the GIC, the GIC invests in over 40 countries around the world. And so I travel extensively. I had very good connections, friendships even, with key policy makers, ministers for finance, even former prime ministers, and above all, businessmen, corporate executives. So they all know me. They know me because of my work at the GIC and because the GIC is a very well-known sovereign wealth fund. So I will be able to engage people from overseas when they come to visit Singapore when I, or when they travel overseas. I'll be able to engage them in meaningful conversation. And at the same time, I will be able to discuss with them what are the issues that will be of concern to, to foreign leaders. 
when they visit Singapore, for example, you know, I will be the most important thing is for me to be able to project Singapore. That although we are a small country, but we do have influence. But that influence depends on my ability as well as that of the government to project Singapore's reputation. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Mr. Tarman, you're up next, and your time starts now. Well, first, I agree with Kok Song's last point. To represent Singapore effectively on the world stage, you have to be able to work with government. The president represents Singapore, and he has to work closely with the government and know what Singapore's interests are. It's been really my privilege to be able to serve Singapore internationally, both through my leadership of various international councils, as well as in building up a solid set of relationships with senior figures in Asia, in the West, in the developing world. And I intend to use that if I'm elected president. But there's an additional characteristic that has to be the Singapore way and the Singapore voice of reason. When we act in leadership internationally, when we contribute internationally, we've got to understand the differences of interest between countries, understand the different plights that countries are in, including in the developing world, and find ways of establishing common ground. That's the biggest missing ingredient in the world today, identifying common ground between contesting parties and countries in very different circumstances. And Singapore, as a small country that owes its, fu its, its future and depends in its future on an open global system, is best placed to find that common ground, respect differences of positions, and find ways of bridging them. That's the Singapore leadership style. Thank you, Mr. Tarman. Mr. Tan, you're next, and your time starts now. Now, I have uh, 20 years. Uh, I was 20 years on the board of a international federation uh, of uh, insurance companies from 65 countries. I, and I served five years as the chairman. Uh, I travel uh, yearly uh, for board meetings and conferences. And before I travel, I take some trouble to understand the culture, the history, and some languages of that country. Uh, and uh, I know songs of many, in many languages through this travel. Uh, I think we should uh, pay respect to other countries, and in turn, they will like us. Uh, now, the, although Singapore is a very small country, I was privileged uh, to be elected as a chairman and served for five years. Uh, I understand uh, the international uh, uh, position of Singapore. We want to promote uh, international cooperation, international trade, uh, and international peace. And we want to have good, friendly relations with neighboring countries. Uh, so those are the government's position. And I, would, I also believe in those positions. And I would be happy to project them. Thank you. And that concludes the first half of our presidential forum. We are going for a break now. But uh, when we return, we'll hear what the candidates have to say about unifying the nation and navigating the future. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Singapore Presidential Forum 2023. I'm Oteli Edwards and with me are the three candidates running to be the next elected president of Singapore. And as a reminder, the candidates get an equal amount of time to speak. Their mics will be faded off once the allotted time is up. And for the next few upcoming questions, candidates will each have one and a half minutes to answer. We started with Mr. Ng during the last question. And so it is Mr. Taman's turn to go first for the next one. What role would you play as president to build a more inclusive and compassionate society? Your time starts now. Well, that's been my whole life purpose, building a fairer and more inclusive society. From my days as a student activist through my 40 plus years in government, and now if I'm fortunate to be elected as president, I intend to be an active president, supporting ground up initiatives by civil society organizations, NGOs, groups of volunteers, every initiative to help everyone with disadvantage. It's not just about charity. It's got to be about upliftment, focused on the kids in the earliest stages of their lives, those who start off with less, focused on the earliest stages of their lives. Early lives matter. Focus on those who are going through mental stress, mental wellness issues at all ages of life. Build second chances and third chances for those who've made a mistake and want to get back up and need that social trampoline, that trampoline of moral support that everyone can provide them. And as we get to be an older society, never lose sight of the fact that it's easy to be lonely as you get older. Help the elderly, particularly those living alone. So every ground up initiative that can help everyone stay together but also feel uplifted is going to help them and it will also help uplift our spirit as a society. Thank you, Mr. Tarman. You're next, Mr. Tang, and your time starts now. I will continue the wonderful tradition of the President's Charity uh, because it involves large numbers of people uh, contributing to worthy causes. Uh, the charity started before President Ong Teng Chong's time, but President Ong uh, expanded those uh, uh, charity events, and I was very privileged to be asked by President Ong to chair his charity to promote the Singapore dress. And this orchid tie, uh, which was worn by President Ong, uh, was given to him uh, by, the, uh, by the charity. I'm, I'm very happy to wear the same tie today. Now, uh, uh, I will certainly want to examine uh, which of these charities we should continue. But I have one more uh, which i like to especially promote, and that is uh, looking after the elderly people, especially those above 80, where they need more care. And it's not only looking after them, it's also relieving the burden on their children. Uh, so that will be one focus. And it will not be just a charity. Uh, it, will also, it should be uh, part of a government effort uh, to look after the... Uh, uh, to look after this elderly population. That would be my focus. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Mr. Ng, you're next and your time starts now. A more compassionate and inclusive society means a more caring, kinder society. I think the, the role that I would play is to encourage Singaporeans to understand that our most fundamental identity is that we are all Singaporeans and therefore we should be helping one another. An important issue today is many people are very vulnerable, you know, either because they are elderly or they are very sick or they are very poor. So I would like to see more efforts being given to supporting volunteers, caregivers, who spend so much time looking after the less fortunate members of our society. So I would like, in my role as president, to be known as the chief volunteer, to inspire all volunteers and to encourage them to do their utmost. And I would also like to see a more inclusive society as embracing everyone who lives in Singapore. For example, migrant workers, our domestic helpers, 
So they are also members of the society. So a compassionate, inclusive society must include these people who are helping our society. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Well, we will be starting with Mr. Tan for the next question. How do you plan to connect with young Singaporeans and involve them in writing the next chapter of the Singapore story? Mr. Tan, your time starts now. now. Young people, the best way to reach them is through social media. And social media keeps evolving. Uh, I'm very much up to date in social media. And I therefore would be able to connect with them and hear their views. Uh, I would also attend events of young people uh, and uh, I want to give uh, young people some advice. Uh, the advice that uh, served me and it will, continue, it will serve them as well. I was young once. I know what young people want. Uh, and uh, my advice would be uh, uh, how they should manage their own finances. Uh, do not overspend. Have some savings. And I think this, is, this advice young people like very much. Uh, from what I have my interaction. So, so certainly I think uh, uh, some of these are very practical advice will reach out to the young people and I, I hope that uh, uh, they find my advice to be useful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tan. Mr Ng, you are next. You have one and a half minutes and your time starts now. Reaching out to young Singaporeans using social media has been the central task, trust of my campaign strategy. And I'm so glad that in the last three weeks, I've been able to reach out to so many young Singaporeans to see them doing social media, creating social media. That is such an encouragement to me. I think the most important thing is for us to inspire hope. Hope in our younger generation for the future. I sense that there's a lot of anxiety about the future. They feel that the future is not going to give them as much opportunities as in the past. So we must have this ability to encourage our young that if they do study hard, if they work hard, Singapore has got plenty of opportunities for them. So I talk about the three elements, self-help, government help, presidential help. And I want to help younger Singaporeans specifically by helping them to be less stressed, hence the practice of meditation. I want them to develop more self-confidence, hence encourage them to take up public speaking skills. And above all, I want to encourage them to think about how to manage their personal finances, how to save and how to invest properly. Thank you, Mr Ng. Mr. Tarman, you're next. Your time starts now. I believe our young will write the next chapter of the Singapore story by being heroes in their own stories. And I don't just mean those who start off as star students, star sports persons, but every individual Singaporean. We have a lot more potential in each individual Singaporean than we often recognise. And it means not just telling everyone that it depends on them and they can make it, but tapping on the power of collective support, peer support, teachers taking a particular interest in the weaker student, giving them a chance, getting the reserves off the sidelines and letting them play in the first team once in a while, letting have everyone be a hero in their own stories. That's the next Singapore chapter. And we can do it. We can do it in the arts, in the sports, in academia, in science, in technology. We've got a lot more potential than we often recognise. Our brightest days are ahead. Do you have anything else to add, Mr Tarman? I've said it. Thank you. Now, Mr Ng, you will be starting the next question. Beyond your ceremonial and community roles, how do you intend to be a unifying figure for the nation? Your time starts now. I want to be a unifying figure for the nation by encouraging more interracial help. 
I think the emphasis in the past has been too much for caring for our own racial community, our own religious community. But I think it would be wonderful if we can move into the next step of encouraging members of one community caring for members of other community. So that's the first point. The second thing is to constantly remind Singaporeans that we are a united nation. We should be united. And hence, I have developed this symbol of the five fingers. The five fingers signify that although we have five different races, religions, languages, yet we are one. We are one palm. So when one finger gets wounded, the whole hand, the whole palm feels the pain. So we must develop this empathy, this compassion towards people of other communities. And so I come back to this very important point that our deepest identity is that we are Singaporeans. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Mr. Tarman, you're next and your one and a half minutes start now. Well, you know, Singapore is an unusual place. We are multiracial, multicultural, multireligious, but peaceful. In our next phase of development, we have to go beyond celebrating our diversity and respecting differences towards deepening that multiculturalism. And it means a lot more participation in each other's cultures. I believe we can do it. We can do something really special, deepen the Singapore identity by participating in each other's cultures as we grow up, not just respecting differences and tolerating them and getting along okay in our daily lives, but become more Singaporean together. Secondly, our democracy is going to become more diverse in its views, in its political leanings, in the thinking of our people. But I have found over the years, over many years, that there are very few differences which cannot be bridged. We've got to work at it. Bridging those differences, even if you can't agree on everything, respect the differences of perspective and find common ground. I intend as a president to advocate that very strongly. Finding that common ground as our democracy becomes more diverse, becomes more diverse, and respecting the fact that at the end of the day, our greatest strength is that we're Singaporeans together. Thank you, Mr. Tarman. Mr. Tan, you're next. You have one and a half minutes and your time starts now. Uh, I, I think the most important uh, factor is that people should feel financially secure. Uh, they, should be, they should be hopeful uh, in their life. Uh, therefore, sorting out the uh, economic situation is very important. Uh, and the key problem now is uh, uh, people find that the cost is too high, housing is too expensive, jobs are, are insecure. Now, if we can solve this problem, which is my main trust, uh, then people uh, got more time to think beyond themselves into the community, uh, into society at large. Then they become more unified. Uh, I, I bring back the Singapore 50 years ago when people were very proud to be Singaporeans uh, because they find that living in Singapore is, uh, uh, is, is they enjoy being Singaporeans. So my focus is let's make life easier for people so they can be more unified uh, and be more looking after other people than, than, than themselves. So... Uh, uh, we should therefore uh, be willing to look into the real issues uh, that are making people worried. When people are worried, they become more divisive. Uh, they, they, they quarrel with their other neighbours. Thank you, Mr Tan. Well, we will start with Mr Tarman for the next question. What major challenges will Singapore face and how will you, within the powers of the President, help Singaporeans to cope? Your time starts now. Well, our first major challenge is that the world is becoming a very troublesome place, a divisive place, a place where the big powers are not seeing eye to eye, and there'll be efforts made by big powers to get us to, get us to be on one side or another, one alliance or another. We've got to avoid that. 
we've got to create space for Singapore internationally with both today's friends as well as those who could be tomorrow's friends, build economic ties, keep up political relations, never underestimate the importance of Singapore being well regarded on the international stage. It started with Mr Lee Kuan Yew and his colleagues and it's carried on since, but we've got to recreate that recognition and respect for Singapore internationally. Secondly, it doesn't work if we don't have respect for each other at home. We've got to deepen our unity among Singaporeans, and we've spoken about that, and I intend to be very active in promoting that. But thirdly, I would also say, never lose sight of the fact that the biggest challenge facing the world, and every country in the world, including small countries like us and small island states like us, is climate change. We've got to start preparing to adapt and to respond to climate change. It may require some new finances. It may require the use of reserves for long-term investments. And the president has to be on top of understanding that challenge. Thank you, Mr. Tarman. Mr. Tan, you have one and a half minutes and your time begins now. Uh, the, the major challenge, uh, major challenges are the uh, global geopolitical tensions, uh, the trade frictions, which affect us badly, uh, and uh, uh, also climate change. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we have also our own uh, internal problems. Uh, we are uh, too costly uh, a place to live and too costly to, uh, uh, to do business. So I consider that we need to be more competitive. Uh, we must find ways to bring down our cost uh, of uh, property, of wages, uh, uh, to bring down our business costs so that we can be competitive uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, these are uh, uh, important uh, 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 challenges that I think the government should, should address. And certainly I would like to uh, discuss with the government uh, whether uh, how we can work towards this goal uh, to make Singapore a more competitive place so that we can have more job opportunities for our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tan. Mr Ng, you have one and a half minutes and your time begins now. Singapore faces two challenges, domestic and international. I think the domestic challenge is that our society, particularly our younger generation, are getting more cynical about government. They're getting less trusting of government. And this is quite worrying for me. And so one very important thing is for the government to restore trust. Trust in the government among the people, especially the younger generation. And how do we do this? I think we have to put right whatever has gone wrong in terms of our standards of trust and integrity. Internationally, of course, there's geopolitical conflict. But as long as we stay united as a nation, we will, we will be able to deal with the risk of the international environment. So staying united is more important than ever. And the president has got to play that unifying role. Because the international environment, though troublesome, also offers, offers opportunities for Singapore. We are a refuge for the rest of the world. And if we are stay united, we will be able to exploit all these opportunities. So both a domestic challenge and an international challenge. Thank you, Mr Ng. Well, we have now heard from the candidates on how they would fulfil the role of elected president. Well, gentlemen, you will now have two minutes for your closing remarks. What do you want to tell voters before they go to the polls on 1st of September? Mr Tan, your now, time starts now. In carrying out my constitutional duties as president, I will have very important and independent mind. I will examine each recommendation from the government on the use of past reserves and the appointment of top officers in the public service uh, critically. And I must be satisfied that they are in the interest of the people uh, before I give my approval. 
Uh, this is what an independent president should do. I will also use the power of the president to call a commission of inquiry when needed to ensure there is transparency and accountability in the government and the public service. My main concern is for the young people of Singapore. The young people face a difficult challenge. They have to compete for jobs against foreigners and good jobs are difficult to get. Yet, our males have to do national service which sets them back two years or more in the competition for jobs. Uh, they have to live, uh, we all have to live with high cost of living and cost of housing is getting to be unaffordable. I understand these concerns and will convey them to the government so that our young people can look forward with confidence to the future. Our, my overall goal is to make life better for the people of Singapore. I believe the government shares a similar goal. I will collaborate and work with the government to find a better way to solve these problems. I ask the people of Singapore to vote for an independent president. Thank you, Mr Tan. I would like to remind viewers of what the elected president can and cannot do. The president cannot express public views on legislation or government policy without being advised to do so by the government. Mr Ng, you're next. You have two minutes and your time starts now. What would you want to tell voters before they go to the polls on 1st of September? I would like to tell voters that I've come forward to serve my country because Singapore needs a president who is competent and experienced and a president who is trustworthy and above all, a president who is non-partisan so that the president does not serve the political agenda of any political party. I would ask the people of Singapore to examine my motives for why I have come forward. I am not motivated by the desire for money, for power or for fame. I truly want to serve my country because I'm very concerned about our future well-being. I'm willing to make the sacrifice necessary so that what we have built up can be safeguarded. I'm quite prepared to, ac to accept the sacrifice that is needed to secure our future. And I have come forward because I have benefited so much from what Singapore has given me. I have come forward to say thank you to the people of Singapore for this opportunity to serve as their president. Thank you, Mr Ng. Finally, Mr Tarman, you have two minutes and your time starts now. Well, let me request each and every Singaporean respectfully to vote for me on Friday as a vote for an optimistic future, a future where your interests, your children's and your grandchildren's interests, a future where all Singaporeans can have an optimistic future. It is very easy to be pessimistic when we look at everything happening in the world, when we look at happenings even in Singapore from time to time. It is very easy to be pessimistic. But when we look at Singaporeans, we become optimistic. When we look at what they're capable of doing, look at Shanti Barrera. Look at what she's achieved in just seven or eight months, qualifying now for the first, first Singaporean to qualify for the semi-finals in the World Athletics Championships, qualifying for the Paris Olympics. It's amazing. Guts and persistence, despite the ups and downs in her life. Look at Stephanie Esther Farm, whom I just met recently. She has cerebral palsy. 
She's inspiring us to look at disabilities differently. She's become a playwright, a leading playwright in disability-led theatre. Look at all the people who take second chances, who continue to inspire me every day through my years on the ground working with them, who tell me when they become mentors that they're not just helping others, but they're helping themselves and we're all changing ourselves. We are an optimistic country because of Singaporeans. But let me finally say, my life is an open book. I've been serving Singapore my entire life through public service and even before. There are no surprises with me. You will not get surprises with me. What you see is what you get. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, we have now come to the end of the Singapore Presidential Forum. We would like to thank all three candidates for participating. And uh, to the audience at home, we hope the last hour has helped you get to know the candidates better for you to make your choice on polling day. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm Mutelli Edwards. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.